Okay. Let's get started. So welcome. My name's Ted Wilmus. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about Janus Graph. I work for a company called Expiro. We're a consulting company. We have UX designers, front-end devs, back-end devs, and we do a lot of graph work and work in kind of difficult spaces uh, where we're working very closely with subject matter experts. So that's uh, that's a particularly good fit for, for these graph databases that are starting to become popular. Here's just a little sampling of the technologies we work with, a lot of open source, uh, and then also licensed technologies. I'm a, a Tinkerpop contributor and also on the uh, Janus Graph uh, Technical Steering Committee. Uh, so I enjoy contributing to those in my free time, and I also do a lot of data stacks, graph, and uh, Neo4j work, so kind of across uh, a number of different database engines in the graph space. So first of all, how many of y'all know what Janus Graph is or have some familiarity? Okay, cool. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not total, a total unknown. So just very briefly, since I'm the first graph talk of the day, I think I'll try to take one for the team and hopefully be the only one who has to show what a property graph is. Um, but Janus Graph uh, stores uh, data as a property graph where we have vertices and edges and the vertices and edges have labels. So we're not talking about a triple store here, but actual property graph. So Janus Graph in particular uh, supports pluggable storage backends uh, and has tight integration with Tinkerpop. So a little bit of history about where Janus came from. So around 2009, uh, the Tinkerpop project started. And that was a graph uh, computing framework uh, that you could use for transactional or analytical processing over graph systems. And a big part of that was this new graph query language called Gremlin. In 2012, the first version of a graph database by the name of Titan was released. This was an open source uh, graph database. Uh, and Titan uh, became pretty popular. Uh, it had a, a tight integration with Tinkerpop. The same folks that were working on Titan were actually working on Tinkerpop, the same team, uh, a, a company by the name of Aurelius. In 2015, Titan had continued to gain momentum. They had their first release. Um, and then a number of those folks, uh, most of them moved over to Datastax and started to work on a new graph database called DSE Graph. So Titan was popular. People were using it out in the community. There was still a hunger for uh, Titan. Uh, people were having success with it. However, development on it kind of just, it stalled out. So in 2015, 2016, it became obvious that uh, Titan really wasn't probably going to progress any further. So at that point, uh, the members of the Titan community who were still interested in it decided to fork Titan. Uh, and that's how we ended up with Janus Graph. So it was around, I think, probably end of 2016 or so when, when we forked, uh, forked Janus Graph from the Titan code base. And so uh, Janus Graph is actually hosted at the Linux Foundation. Uh, it's Apache Software V2 licensed. Uh, and part of our value proposition is up-to-date Tinkerpop support, so Gremlin language support that uh, rapidly follows the Gremlin Tinkerpop releases. We still have this pluggable storage uh, architecture that allows you to plug in different storage layers and indexing engines. Um, and that gives you the capability to kind of tune the graph database to your particular use case. So do you need asset transactions? Are you okay with eventually consistent? Do you want to scale out or scale up? And then lastly, and I have it in bold on here uh, uh, on the slide on purpose, is we have a vibrant and growing community. So you hear about open source and you hear about community, and that might sound kind of wishy-washy. So what does that actually mean? So for a community, uh, for, from the Janus perspective, what we did is even though we're at the Linux Foundation, we tried to uh, run Janus Graph under a similar governance model to an Apache project, because a number of us also work on Apache projects. And so one of my favorite just sort of one-liners from the Apache Foundation is, if it didn't happen on a mailing list, it didn't happen. 
And so what that means is all the communication about the project where decisions are being made, maybe it's not literally a mailing list anymore, it might be something in a GitHub issue, um, but a mailing list, GitHub issue, everything's out in the open, it's public. So anybody can take part in conversations. Uh, it's not behind uh, some other firewall where there's some mysterious uh, force making decisions. So we have contributors that are from industry, so they're vendors. Uh, we have individuals who are just graph hobbyists. They're just interested in contributing to open source. Uh, and then we have the Janus graph users themselves, who maybe they're using Janus and they find an issue or want a new feature, and then they go in and they work on it and add it to Janus. So there's no centralized authority. So what I would say to y'all, and I'll kind of say it again at the end, is if you're interested in Janus, we welcome you into the community. Even if you're just answering questions on a user list or something like that, that is invaluable. So we really appreciate it. Okay, so now into the nuts and bolts. So Janus Graph, like I mentioned, uh, has this pluggable architecture. So Janus Graph sits on top, it's written in Java. Uh, you can run it in, It's usually you'll run it in its own JVM and then it's gonna connect to, for sure, a storage layer because Janus itself doesn't store any data. Um, we support Cassandra, Apache uh, HBase, Oracle Berkeley DB, uh, Scylla, uh, Google Bigtable, and then Janus also has its own in-memory uh, in memory option. On the indexing side, this isn't required, but if you want advanced indexing functionality, like geospatial search, full text search, um, you can plug in an indexing backend like Elasticsearch, Solar, or Lucene. If we look at the Janus project itself, this can be a little confusing to newcomers because there's all these funny words running around like Tinkerpop. It's a pretty strange word. So that, that, can, that can throw people for a loop. But Janus integrates and gets a lot of its querying uh, functionality from Tinkerpop. So Tinkerpop basically has the Gremlin query language, an optimization and execution engine for the language itself, and then the graph provider, so in this case, Janus Graph, or maybe if you're talking about DSC Graph, DSC Graph, basically plugs there into Tinkerpop so that Tinkerpop can then run queries over that underlying graph database. So at the top, we have Tinkerpop, then we have internal Janus APIs, database layers, and then the uh, abstractions and adapters for storage and indexing. On the left, we won't talk about this too much, but one of the things that we get kind of for free with Tinkerpop is the ability to run OLAP large scale graph jobs over uh, your graph on a platform like Spark uh, or Giraffe. So you can have your Janus data pulled up into Spark where you can then run some distributed computations on it. So as I mentioned already, Janus gives you a variety of deployment options based upon the storage backends you could choose. You could start and do a simple, you know, Berkeley DB deployment on a single box, or you could even pay Oracle and do a Berkeley uh, uh, setup where you maybe did have some failover capabilities. That would also give you uh, uh, acid transactions because Janus bases its transaction model on the storage adapter. Or you could go all the way, and we'll see this a lot with Cassandra deployments, is maybe you're going to run two data centers, actually. And so you have a data center to serve your transactional load, and then you have another data center that isolates out the analytical load uh, from the transactional load. So a lot of flexibility. So why is Apache Tinkerpop so important? Apache Tinkerpop is really, when you're using Janus, that's how you're interacting with Janus. So Apache Tinkerpop largely defines the experience that you're gonna have from a user perspective when it comes to the language that you're using to interact with the graph database. 2017 was a really, really big year for Tinkerpop. It's been around for a while now, but it was a really big year. Uh, a, few, a, a few things that I'd just like to highlight as part of this talk, because as a Janus user, you get the same benefits that you would uh, from using Tinkerpop. So much uh, improved uh, language support. So I'll show an example in a second, but now we have these embedded uh, Gremlin language variants that really make it easy to code and call a remote database from your user application without having to send strings over and things like that. We've expanded uh, out from the JVM, so we have Python, there's a .NET, uh, GLV, and then also it was committed, it's not in a release yet, but it's been merged, there's a JavaScript uh, GLV that'll be coming out soon too. Then we have Gremlin DSL support, which I'll show a few examples of. And then just some notable vendors. The more 
vendors and uh, graph database providers that we get on Tinkerpop, the better. And so we had two really big ones this year. Uh, Amazon Neptune announced uh, Tinkerpop support, and then uh, kind of at the beginning of the year, Microsoft Cosmos DB. So that's that's a big deal. We like to see that. Here's a few other uh, Tinkerpop enabled graph DBs. So even though uh, Tinkerpop isn't a, a uh, there, there's not really a standard graph language right now, um, you can see that Gremlin has has support across a, a large large number of these databases. So language embedding, this is this is pretty neat, but uh, this now lets you write your graph queries in the language you're developing in. So if you're writing a Java application and you're using the Tinkerpop driver to access Janus Graph, uh, you can just write your Gremlin query in Java like you would be writing it if you were running in embedded mode. So there's no need to build strings and put them together and send them over. Uh, Gremlin takes care of that for you. So that's really nice. It makes it easy to also switch between different graph database providers. If you want to try any of the other ones out on the list, it's, it's really simple to do that. In a lot of cases, you can keep that same Tinkerpop driver. And then here's just a few other examples. The only differences between these languages are their small stylistic changes uh, to make it fit in with the style of the, that particular language. Then we have Gremlin DSLs. Uh, one thing that uh, I think users showed a lot of interest in uh, is the ability to come up with their own graph DSLs that in turn get turned into Gremlin behind the scenes. So here's just a little example of a, of a simple Gremlin query. Find the number of persons who created at least two projects. So really simple little model. We might want to create a social DSL. So pretend this was an actual social networking type application. So if you go over there, there's a, there's a link to some more details on this. Or if you go on the Tinkerpop site, you can see how this is done. But Tinkerpop has made it incredibly easy to put together your own DSL where you're use, using actual domain language in the query. So if you had other users of your application who may not be developers, it's easy to make something that's comfortable to them. Here's just another quick example. Okay, so no graph should be an island. Graph databases have been around for a little while, not very long in the scheme of things. If you look at the SQL ecosystem, one of the big benefits of, of the relational databases is there's a bajillion tools you can put over the top of any SQL database that you have. So that just makes adoption way easier. So we're not, we're not near that level yet with the graph databases, but we've made, a, made some, uh, some good improvements lately. So here's just a few examples. So Janus graph integration, they will talk specifically about two of them, but here's a little sampling. We have a few visualization options, Lincurious key lines. Um, there's, as I said, analytical processing options with Spark. Uh, and then from a framework perspective, we have things like Drop Wizard, Tinkerpop that make it easy to just plug in graph support into say a new Drop Wizard microservice that you're developing. So here's uh, Cambridge Intelligence Key Lines. They announced Janus Graph Connectivity. Um, and this is a, a library so that you can put together network diagram and other sorts of interesting visualizations on top of your graph database. So if you're developing an application that's using a graph database and you want to actually display that data as a graph, um, this, is, this is one option. Another company, uh, Lincurious, they have uh, two interesting products. One is Lincurious Enterprise, which is actually a standalone uh, application that you can run over the graph and then interactively explore uh, your graph data. And so there's no actual development involved there. It's just a tool out of the box you can plug into Janus and start exploring visually. Uh, they have a library too for developers. So if you want to develop, again, network, uh, network diagrams and things like that, you can use their tool. On the hosting side uh, this year, Compose uh, IO announced Janus Graph, the first uh, Janus Graph database as a service uh, solution. And so that's actually running on top of ScyllaDB. So if you don't want to bother with cluster maintenance and learning all those fun intricacies of, of uh, managing a distributed system, you can hop on over to Compose and just stand up a Janus instance in a, in a cluster running on Scylla for, for high performance Janus. So here's, here's just a few uh, of, of uh, the people that are actually using Janus out there. We always like to hear back from the folks who are using Janus. So if you are and you're interested in being on the website, uh, 
hit us up and uh and we would love to have you i'll just talk about uh two in particular um so one is g data they're a company that actually they i didn't wasn't aware of this uh, until recently but they actually developed the first antivirus software and they actually use uh, janus to identify and classify malware into different families. So they take malware data and they have a network of command and control servers, API endpoints, and they've built this graph out. And when they get a new malware sample in, they use this for classification of that data. This is a good example of a Titan user who enjoyed using Titan, had success with it, uh, was kind of like, okay, what's gonna happen next? Then Janus came out, we got a release out, and then they moved over to Janus. So if you were on Titan, uh, Janus was storage layer compatible with Titan. So you don't need to do anything other than deploy, uh, you know, a new Janus binary. You don't have to do any sort of uh, data migration. So why did they? Uh, why were they interested in Janus? Uh, really, the modular design, the Tinkerpop support, and then again that active and growing community. So. Uh, the fellow Florian Hockman, who, who, who was kind enough to provide this information to me, he's an active contributor on the list uh, and uh, gives back to the community in many great ways while they're actually using the software too. Second one is an open source project called Apache Atlas. Uh, this is a metadata management solution. Uh, and they, again, were a Titan user who ended up moving over to Janus. They run just a single instance of Janus right now. Uh, on Berkeley DB, I believe it is. And again, they like the ability to have this modular design uh, so that eventually if they do have users who are using different sorts of backends that they can use those. A lot of times, say if your team's already comfortable with Cassandra, um, it's nice to not have to learn the uh, operations and the management uh, for a new distributed system. They can just use those same skills, but then put the graph database layer on top of it. Okay, so now for a little bit of a update on uh, as to where the project actually is right now, and then we'll talk where it's about where it's going next. So a year in review. So it was about the end of 2016, like I mentioned, when Janus uh, forked. Um, and so at day to day last year uh, in Austin in January, that was basically the uh, kind of the first sort of public announcement, I guess you could say, aside from just mailing lists, that Janus was around and it was going to be a thing. So here's just a, a little bit of the history about what's been going on since then. We've had three releases, um, commits from 42 people. And so I was looking back where there was a graph day in San Francisco in June of uh, 2017. We had 25 uh, people that had committed since then, and now we're up to 42. So there's some really good growth in that aspect. And then a lot of those uh, vendors that I mentioned in the integration section, they're also, they've just come on this year too. So we have a growing list of third party uh, vendors that are actually integrating and, oh, I don't think I'm gonna go to that. <laughs> So what have we accomplished since then? Um, I put this one first. This isn't like the most exciting thing in the world, it's, if you're a developer probably, like testing, whatever, <laughs> you know. But it's actually really important. So Janus Titan had a, had a really good set of unit tests and, and integration tests and things like that. But they took a long time to run. Uh, they were fairly fragile. Um, and so even though we had a lot of good coverage, it was just onerous and it made it really hard to get the momentum and actually, you know, easily review PRs and make sure things aren't breaking. So we had a number of contributors who did a ton of work to clean that up. Um, and so we're still working on it, uh, but we have a really solid test suite now uh, that's automated to an extent that it wasn't before. And so even though it's not a super snazzy thing, as far as, you know, end user features, we are, uh, very concerned about stability of the system and being able to move forward quickly, especially when we get new contributors on board. So if you don't have good, a good way to test things out, it just makes it hard for folks. So this, uh, also improves the testing that we have across all these different backends. One complexity, of course, on the development side is, okay, well, that's cool, you support HBase, Cassandra, blah, 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 but there's different versions of all of those. And you can imagine that to test all of those things, uh, it's important because you'll run into strange 
incompatibilities sometimes on certain versions. So we've improved that and made it uh, made it so that those sorts of tests are running against the storage backends and the uh, different versions of the indexing backends. Another uh, big thing that we did was, I don't know if are any of y'all Cassandra users in here? Anybody? Yeah, a little bit, yeah, okay. So uh, Janus historically in Titan used a, a, an older driver when it was interacting with uh, Cassandra. It was a thrift based driver. There were a few different options, but that's been deprecated. That's going away. So what we did is created a new CQL uh, storage adapter that uses the up to date uh, data stacks drivers. It's much improved over the uh, the old thrift based adapter, and actually is much better about routing your request to the correct nodes in the in the cluster. So there's definitely performance enhancements there. Again, there's no actual data migration here. If you're already using Janus on Cassandra, you don't need to change anything other than just say, "Hey, switch over and use this new driver." So that's been a that's been a nice improvement. That also works any. Anytime I'm talking about Cassandra here too, these things also work over Scylla, if you're interested in Scylla. Okay, some other notable version updates. We added in a Google Cloud Bigtable adapter, so you can actually run uh, Janus on Google Cloud Bigtable, which is pretty cool. Uh, works on Ca Apache Cassandra 2 and 3 uh, in both OLAP and OLTP mode. Uh, the latest version is ScyllaDB. Um, I won't read them all to you, but another big thing was we were pretty far behind previously on Elasticsearch versions, and that's much more up to date now. So if you're running a newer Elast Elasticsearch uh, cluster, this will be compatible with that. The next release of Janus um, will bump up uh, the 021 release will bump up to Tinkerpop 326, and then the uh, 030 release will go to 3.3, .3, maybe one. I'm not sure exactly, but. On the search side, this is kind of interesting. When I first was us using uh, graph databases, we didn't, I wasn't doing any uh, full text search or anything like that, but this has really taken off. So a lot of folks will use these geospatial uh, and full text search capabilities. When I showed those adapters plugging in to Janus, what I should have also said is when you're writing your Gremlin query, you're not, you don't need to care about where different lookups are going to. Is it going to the index? Or is it going to, uh, you know, the storage adapter? That's that's behind the scenes where that optimization happens. So these are new options that you can actually use in your queries. We added in a fuzzy two fuzzy search options. So in addition to all these other ones that we have, where you can do these sorts of geospatial searches, you can also do fuzzy searches now. On the Elastic Search uh, and other search uh, uh, side of things. The Elasticsearch pipeline, now we can support doing transformations on that data that you're indexing into Elasticsearch if you wanted to add some additional uh, transformations into that pipeline, say pull specific dates out of bodies of text or something like that. You can set that up to index. Uh, we added on the solar side support for list and set cardinality properties. So in Gremlin, you can have properties that are actually more than have more than one value. So that's supported on the indexing side. And then from a performance standpoint, previously we were pulling back all of the indexing results at once from the index uh, providers. Now we actually can stream them back. So that helps from a latency perspective. So 2018. So these are these are I just kind of I went out and I looked at uh, looked at what was going on in GitHub and and kind of what was in flight for this. Like I said, this is a community project. So there's not there's not like some official set of milestones somewhere. The work that gets done is the work that people put in as issues and pull requests and then decide to work on. So take this with a little bit of a grain of salt, but these are things that I identified as is probably uh, uh, likely in the in the fairly nearish term, and then uh, if you have more ideas, we'd love to hear them. So a big one is schema enhancements. Um, Janus has a little bit of uh, support for schema in it already. You can say uh, assign data types to properties. Um, you can create vertex and edge labels, and then constrain those so that if a user were to put in a, a edge label or vertex label that doesn't exist, it would it would not allow that. But we'd like to take that to the next level where you can actually specifically tie properties to specific 
vertex and edge labels. So more like akin to a relational database where you have specific columns on, on tables. Right now you can put a property on anything and, and it won't tell you if, uh, if that's okay or not. I think what this is also going to do is allow us to open the door for other sorts of check constraints, min max constraints, not null constraints. We have a uniqueness constraint right now, but not much outside of that. So this is something where it's fun. It's easy to get started with your database if there's no constraints on it, but then you're going to pay the price afterwards. So we'd like to add in more options for folks, not force them, but add more options in to actually have these constraints so the database is, is giving you some level of protection. On the security and performance side, uh, Janus Graph um, was already uh, integrated to a, with Gremlin Server, and Gremlin Server did provide security, but there were some some uh, performance issues with how how that was set up. So there's been some recent work uh, that that's been merged in where that has been improved. Uh, so now you can actually store your authentication information uh, performantly in the Janus Graph database itself. So that'll be nice. On the performance side, uh, there's, I think, a fair amount of low-hanging fruit still where we can make some big performance improvements. Some of those will come from improvements to how the optimization, the query optimization happens. Tinkerpop gives us some query optimizations, um, but then we also have to plug in our own that are specific to Janus's operating characteristics. And so one just simple example is here. We have a pull request right now to better, better handle ORing. Uh, in, in queries where you're going to run a query and there's an index where it could use a search index. Maybe you're searching across a few different properties in the search index. Uh, right now, if you were to use an or, it wouldn't be smart enough to push that down into the search index itself. So since we do have these integrations, uh, one of the prices that we pay of that extra abstraction is we do have limited push down capability. So at any point where we can push further processing down into the index or the storage layer, we need to take advantage of that. Um, there's other opportunities too, similar to those where we'll look for patterns in the queries and optimize those. And then a big one will be improved storage adapter retrieval patterns. So there's already been some work done on this, uh, but right now it's, it's a little bit spotty. What we need to do is actually make it so that these storage adapters are retrieving data in parallel uh, for your Gremlin query. So for example, if you're using Cassandra or Scylla, uh, the best way to retrieve a large amount of data is usually not to just send one big old bulk request like the equivalent of an in clause, but instead to break that up into a bunch of separate queries, send them off asynchronously, and then get the data back. And so we have some support for that now, but we'll be making improvements in that area. Lastly, the, I've seen some work uh, and suggestions on the uh, graph cache. So there's a, a few different caching layers in Janus. Um, there's some performance improvements that I think we could have there pretty easily. And then also, nobody's picked this up yet, but there has been talk of maybe looking at plugging in, say, a distributed caching option. Right now, all the caches are just local to the individual Janus instances, so they're not kept in sync. So I don't know if that'll actually happen, but that's something that people have been discussing. A big one uh, that's not uh, related to, I guess, the uh, technology uh, necessary, uh, necessarily like new functionality and stuff is, this is just, this is just kind of uh, my opinion really more than anything else, but user onboarding. So right now uh, we're really a lot like that top little picture. Like if you're new to graph databases, um, you're like the little turtle at the race who's going to take forever to figure out what's going on because there is a lot that you have to learn. So Janus Graph and Tinkerpop have a ton of documentation. Um, it's, it's honestly like it's, it's, it's very good, especially for open source projects. It's super comprehensive, but it is, it is a ton to, to figure out. So if you're a new user, new to graph databases, we need a more streamlined process for getting you on board. So I'm not sure if any of you guys are Neo4j users, or I'm sure you're familiar with it. They are a prime example of an awesome user onboarding experience, and we are, we are far beyond that. <laughs> so maybe looking to uh, folks like that for some inspiration, I think we can make some big improvements there. And so I think what that could mean is some more focused portions of our documentation that are really targeted at those folks that are maybe new to graph and really want to get started quickly. 
Um, the other part of this too, and this uh, I'll, I'll make a, a plea is if again if you are using Janus, f and if it's working well or if it's not working well, we're gonna have a new section on the uh, website for blog posts from actual users. Um, so we would love to hear from you. So getting involved, uh, there's a few different uh, ways that you can actually get involved with the project. Um, here's just a few links. We have our Google Groups. Uh, we have folks that are on Gitter periodically. Uh, so if you want to pop in there and ask questions, you can usually get a get an answer uh, relatively quickly. <laughs> um, and then, of course, check out GitHub, uh, and you can follow progress on there. So first, I would like to say, before I open this up for any questions, special thanks to Misha Brookman, who's, I think, right back there, and Jason Plurad. They, they uh, were kind enough to review these slides, and they're actually two, uh, two big contributors to this project and have done a ton of work on it, so especially bringing it to the Linux Foundation. So big thanks to them. So at this point, uh, thank you for coming, and what questions do you have? Anything? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And that, that's one of the big onboarding problems we actually have, is you can get good performance out of Janus, Graph, and Titan, but it can require, in certain cases like you're talking about, kind of you have to do things you know, just right, and there's a lot of tweaking that's involved. Um, and again, it's if you want to go figure that out, that's fine, but realistically speaking, people don't have time to do that. So uh, I've I can I've seen successful deployments where you can scale out and get thousands of you know um, continuous insertions of vertices per second, um, but you have to be very aware of how to set it up right to do that. So I think that's one spot uh, where we need some better documentation and examples. Mm hmm. Yeah, right now we don't, we don't, that's a really good idea because we don't really have a resource, specific resource that's tuned like that. Usually what, because you're absolutely right, like if you're running on Cassandra, that's a totally different beast than HBase, and that's a definitely totally different beast than Berkeley DB. And so the, usually the, the folks that have the most success are also very knowledgeable already about the storage layer. Um, so it's, 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 it's kind of like a, I feel like it's a little bit like a Ferrari, like you need to, it's very, it can be finicky. So you need to understand the mechanics of everything right now to get the best performance out of it. That's not where I think it has to be. Um, but that's just, you know, the state that I think we want to improve on. But yeah, no, that's fundamental to like if, and, and even Say the big thing, uh, when you go distributed with a graph and your graph actually becomes partitioned across, you know, more than one node, um, that, that's, a, that's a whole nother issue. Um, and so looking at what the performance is going to be like as you scale out, uh, trying to figure out a lot of times, right now there's, kinda, there's a bifurcation of OLTP and OLAP in, in Janus Graph and others other graph databases. Whereas in the relational world, it's like, the way I think about it, the relational world, if you want to run analytical queries, 
there's analytic specific RDVMSs like Vertica or whatever, but also you could run them on Postgres to a certain extent. And the engine stays the same, but the model changes. So you move to fact tables and dimension tables. On the graph right now, it's the opposite. It's like the model stays the same, but suddenly now you're running in a totally different engine. So I just said a little bit at the beginning about that Tinkerpop OLAP piece. So the other thing that I see a lot across the graph engines is customers have an expectation from the relational world that uh, the database should kind of gracefully go from OLTP to OLAP. And that's not really true at this point. Um, so you want to be able to run that mixture of queries. And so that's another spot where it can be hard for people to figure out yeah, what fits in to the you know, so-called OLTP graph paradigm versus the analytical graph paradigm. Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for OLT, well, out of the box, just with the distribution, uh, without, you know, setting anything up, you can start up, like if you run Janus Graph Start right now, what it's going to do is start up Cassandra, and it's going to start up Elasticsearch. Um, now, the way that Berkeley is run embedded, you can also just out of the box, you know, s set up a Berkeley database. So that's what comes by default. Um, on the OLTP side, we don't have a specific recommendation. I mean, just anecdotally speaking, I would say, you, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I would guess it's probably more on the Cassandra side and then there's folks running on HBase. And then the Berkeley is probably, I don't see many folks just running just a single instance Berkeley. Like the that Apache Atlas they do, but I'd say most folks are running it over a distributed data store with Cassandra being probably the most popular. Um, on the OLAP side, at that point, it's really all tinker pop and it's going to be Spark is the big one. So in the way that that works is you can still run a regular Gremlin query. And so in a sense, it's transparent, but you're running this Gremlin query. And what's really happening is the data is being pulled out of Cassandra up into Spark RDDs. And then the execution is happening there. So Spark's the big one there. So, and I don't like to overgeneralize too much because the graph database sphere is is growing and there are there are many other ones so when i'm talking it's more on the tinker pop you know the the tinker pop side of things thank you. thanks a lot <laughs> appreciate it